many a project manager over the years, many a CEO will have lamented their technology team and how difficult they can be to work with. Quite often, the missing link there is having an effective chief technology officer or technology manager. And so today, we're going to be talking about what makes a great one of those, why tech teams are perceived as difficult to work with, and some handy strategies on how to get yourself out of that hole if you're stuck in it. And to help me do that is Chief Technology Extraordinaire, Mr. Douglas Squirrel, who has spent many years as a CTO himself. He's got a whole list of achievements, which we'll be hearing about as well. Very interesting work. And so we'll be talking through some of those challenges of working with, getting the best from and leading tech teams, why they can be perceived as difficult to work with, the value in conflict and how to do it productively to accelerate yourself and your business towards success instead of being afraid of failure, and much more besides. And we'll even have time to talk about the future of AI and the implications that may have for all of these things as well. So it's going to be a useful conversation about some important topics that are relevant to anyone working in a tech business or startup, or anyone who's ever had to work with or is currently working with someone who they perceive as difficult. Not to give, I should say, tech teams a bad name. Takes two to tango, after all. So let's get into it. This is Leading with Integrity, Leadership Talk the podcast for first-time managers who are working in tech-driven businesses and teams and who want to be more effective people-first leaders. Each week, you will learn the crucial strategies, mindsets, and practical tips that successful modern leaders follow to be engaging, ethical, and authentic managers who get the best from their teams. And we'll achieve all of this via weekly conversations with leaders, with leadership experts, entrepreneurs, and business owners, people who have already walked this path and have some amazing insights to share. With an added sprinkling of occasional solo episodes and some group chats where we'll have multiple guests. My name is David Hatch and I will be your host. And leadership has always been a passion for me. After a career spent in a series of small businesses during 15 years in the aerospace industry, five or six of those at the end of that career were in a space startup in the UK. So trying to launch satellites into orbit, very cool stuff. And through all of that experience, I learned that the secret to successful management is in the ability to apply great leadership. And in turn, the secret to great leadership It's all about your integrity, putting people before profits. Welcome to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership Talk for the Modern Manager, with your host, David Hatch. Douglas, thank you so much for joining me this morning for you, this afternoon for me, and for joining us from from your car as well, which I have to say is a first, I think, for a podcast guest here. It's certainly not how I planned it, but the roofers showed up. And uh, I decided to be creative and escape the pounding noises. Fair enough, too. Um, yeah, and it adds a bit of variety, I think, to to my day. There anyway. you go. <laughs> Excellent. Apologies to visual viewers. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not in my normal beautiful location, which is England, actually, in a 600 year old house. But I'm oh, visiting maybe. North Carolina right now with some family who yeah. are also surprised by the roofers. Well, it's better that than something caving in, isn't it? I think um, it certainly <laughs> is. <laughs> Anyway, so let's let's kick off then by really handing over to you to introduce yourself, tell the listeners a bit about what you do, a bit about your career background, and yeah, why why you do what you do as well. Fantastic. Well, um, I'm an expert in uh, making technology teams insanely profitable, and I do that with loads and loads of companies around the world. Um, it's up to something like 200 now. 
uh, in uh, Australia and the U.S. and uh, all across Europe and Africa and you name it. I've got to work in all kinds of very interesting places with all kinds of different industries and uh, technologies and um, types of organization from two people in a garage to hundreds of uh, or, or thousands of engineers. So uh, that's what I do. Um, the history is, um, uh, ver let's say, varied, very varied. Um, so I worked in three or four different startups as a CTO, as a VP of engineering, as some kind of technical executive. And every time I got fired in the nicest possible way, because the founder or the CEO would come to me and say, Squirrel, We've got this amazing team. You've built them up. You've trained them. You've got a leader. You've got really effective processes. And gosh, there's not much for you to do. And gee, you're kind of expensive. So why don't you go be wonderful somewhere else? And the third or fourth time I got fired like that, I said, maybe I should plan for this. Maybe I should just have the intention of getting in, making things run smoothly, helping an organization to function and get a, a real significant return on its technology investment and then get the heck out of there and do something else. So for a while, I was an interim CTO where I'd work with essentially one or two companies at a time and be a technical leader for them. And these days, I'm a consultant who coaches those technical leaders, who advises people on how to hire the right technical leader, uh, who helps uh, heads of sales, heads of product, heads of uh, uh, customer service interact with their technology team more effectively. So I coach across the whole organization, do strategy for the whole company, help with getting the the most out of the technology yeah and that must have been a really interesting career actually you know, having the chance to get exposed to so many different technical type organizations and it reminds me as well it's it's one of the one of the tests of good leadership isn't it actually is that you, you effectively make yourself redundant so you know that speaks volumes about you as well i think <laughs> well i certainly enjoyed doing it and uh you're right i certainly learned a heck of a lot have you seen any big sort of differences and similarities apart from the obvious between those really small working out of the, the garage type businesses and then the thousands of developers kind of companies? Surprisingly few. Um, the amazing thing is that the um, uh, problems are the same. They're just of a different size. Anyway, the answer to your question is that the uh, large organizations just multiply the kinds of communication problems that the small organizations have. But you would think that, that you know, the large organization will have trouble communicating between the, the Africa division and the Australia division or something like that. But heck, the, the small organizations have trouble communicating from the second floor to the third floor or from the um, product team to the technology team. So really, there's much less difference than you think. The thing that everybody misses uh, and the skill that's lacking is how to have good conversations, how to have a, a productive conflict. So wherever, where the second floor, third floor, Africa, Australia, um, you're having a, a debate and a discussion that is productive, returns results to the organization rather than just being butting heads. Yeah, I, I guess that's encouraging in a way, isn't it? That, it, that this, there are those similarities wherever you go. I do find it interesting as well whenever some people mention the, the constructive conflict kind of thing. A couple of people I've worked with in the past have conflated a good conflict with conflict is good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, it's and very that's always different. a tricky order, one. Order yeah, of yeah. words is important. <laughs> And I tend to it say is. a productive conflict. I'm not unhappy with constructive. I also talk about having yeah. a constructive no. But mm -hmm. the, um, the reason I choose productive specifically is mm -hmm. that I want to measure that conflict on its return on investment. I want to measure what's the profit that we're making from this conflict. And that's a way of thinking that most people don't have. They tend to think of conflict as a cost. And I want to minimize conflict. I want to reduce the amount of debate and discussion. And that's not what you want. You want to have conflict that uh, produces a useful result that tests ideas and gives you better ideas. And if you have those better ideas, you can implement them. You make more money. And that's really what I would like people to, to think about when they think about, gosh, should I have this conflict or should I avoid it? I should have it and I should make a profit from it. Yeah, conflict is one of those words, isn't it, where people, as you say, they, they try to avoid it. They, they, it's automatically perceived as a bad thing, a negative thing. And in a lot of contexts, I guess, but it's because it is. Uh, <laughs> but as you say, it's, it's about People the way who do you do it poorly. Have that problem. 
Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and at a geopolitical level, it's probably quite bad on, on the whole. Um, <laughs> it's, it's extraordinarily bad there. Thankfully, I'm not trying to solve world peace, right? No, that exactly. I'm not trying to do. I'm trying to get people to get more out of the software they use. That That's my purview. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it, it's, I see it as quite similar to, to failure as well. And again, you know, a lot of people go to great lengths to avoid that when actually that's where you'll learn the most. That's where you'll get the better outcome in the long term. Because similarly with conflict, if you just go to extreme lengths to avoid it, what you're really doing is avoiding the big lesson there. You're avoiding, as you've described, the ability to bat things around a bit and, and arrive at the best potential solution instead of just everyone agreeing with the first one because it's an easier life. It might be an easier life in the short yeah. term. Absolutely. And and what you have to do is you have an active um, program. You have to have um, a vigorous leadership setting the culture that conflict is okay conflict is valid Con here's how we do conflict this is a skill that we have and something that we're trying to improve because the the cultural messages are that well, conflict is negative won't help us we we don't want failure we wouldn't want to uh, try something and have it not work you want exactly the opposite message um, all the time pounding into the people in your organization so that when the technologists come along and say, hey, we tried the new button, we tried the new conversion rate method, and it uh, didn't work, nobody says that was terrible, that was a big failure. What people say is that was a successful experiment with a negative result. And the more you can get people thinking that way, the more you can play the broken record on failure and conflict are good, the more success you'll have. Yes. Yeah, no, I really like that, actually. It's very well put. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think it leads us well into the next question I've got for you as well, because you mentioned leadership there already. And, and I think the, the showing and telling people how to do that well is so, so important. And so my next question is, in your experience, I'm guessing those things and more, but what makes a great chief technology officer? Ah, OK. Well, certainly those. But since I've covered those, let me cover a few others. Um, surprisingly, technical prowess comes at like five or six, so I'm probably not going to get to that one. Uh, it's important to understand the technology, but the, the words chief and officer are much more important than the word technology uh, in, in, that, um, uh, in that title. So, for example, uh, it's very important that an effective uh, CTO has strong relationships with people outside technology and has a good way, has good skills at um, translating back and forth how engineers talk and how computers talk, which is a very rigid and uh, black and white world, into the uh, shades of gray and great complexity of customer service and sales and marketing and all the rest of the organization. If the CTO can't speak marketing speak and have a good negotiation and a good productive conflict with someone in marketing, you're going to have a crazy uh, uh, product roadmap. Right? You're, you're not going to build things that make any sense because your technology team is, is going to be focused on all the wrong things. Uh, similarly, uh, what a, 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 an effective CTO really has to have is a grip on what customers are asking for and the ability to say no. And I mentioned this previously, uh, it, it needs to be a constructive no. So uh, I was illustrating this with one of my clients. They were saying, you know, uh, we, we uh, have, have said yes to all our clients and we've managed to build lots and lots of wonderful things, but they don't add up to a product and they're not scalable. So we're actually not making very much money. And I say, what you need is the, uh, the skill of giving a constructive no. And a constructive no doesn't just say, no, we won't do that. Engineers are really good at that. Yeah. No, we don't have the time for that. We haven't put that in our schedule. That is technically infeasible or we have too much tech debt, all those kinds of answers. But those aren't constructive no's. A constructive no says, I, I either understand or I need to understand the reason for your request. And then here's how we're going to meet that request. And so infrequently do people hear this that I need to model it for them. It might sound something like this. We aren't going to build the new login mechanism because we're going to switch to single sign-on next quarter. And that's going to mean people don't have to memorize any passwords at all. So although we might have a small security issue in the next quarter, we're going to help to mitigate that. And then when we switch to single sign-on, no one will have to memorize passwords and we won't have to worry about the security audit. Now, I just made up that scenario, 
But that's the kind of response that I bet most people listening here have never heard from a technologist. And that's not because the technologists aren't interested or don't want to do it better. It's because they don't know how and no one's ever shown them and they don't have the trust with the rest of the organization that would allow them to do it. it yeah, it's an interesting one. And I think that it highlights as well the the power of asking questions, I think. Because if that were me and I just got to know, I'd immediately ask why. I'd like to understand, could you explain it to me? But again, you know, a lot of people don't think like that. They just almost be offended at being told no. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a problem with why. There's a problem yeah. with why as well. It's a perfectly good setup. Well, I always tell people, if you're not sure what to do in a conversation, ask a question. And why mm -hmm. is a good question. So I'm perfectly happy with it. But there's a problem, namely that when you ask why, it's often perceived as an attack. And you can go read about this in um, Never Split the Differences. I think the book, I might be getting that wrong. Folks are, are w welcome to get in touch with me and I'll find the right reference. But um the, the notion is that if you're negotiating, say, with a terrorist or someone who's taken hostages or something like that, if you're in a much uh, bigger conflict than any of us are likely ever to be in in our lives, I hope, then one of the things you're trained not to do is ask, why did you take these hostages or why did you, uh, you know, take this extreme action? Because that will that is often perceived as um, not good listening, not good interaction, not empathy by the other person. If they got their finger on the trigger, that's pretty bad. Now, we don't have to worry about bombs going off, but certainly it, it's very helpful to try to defuse situations and lead to a productive conflict rather than one where the pers other person is feeling very defensive. So I tend to uh, suggest that people who hear an unconstructive no say, can you tell me more about that? Can you expand on that? Um, it's like when uh, you know, my mom, who was a, uh, a teacher, would, would get a, a painting or a picture from a three or four year old that she was teaching. And uh, she said, do you never say, what is this a picture of? You never say, uh, why did you draw this picture? You say, tell me more about your picture. Because you know, it's a scribble, but the kid has it something very clearly in their head and they will tell you and that's very interesting. Similarly, that technologist who is saying no is saying no for a reason that you'd like to get to, but a why may be too aggressive and try asking them, tell me more about that. Can you expand on that? And then see if you can lead that into um, what other options exist. Indeed, yes. Uh, I, th I threw out the word why there as a cursory statement without thinking about it, but of course you're well, right. And I'm not beating you up for it because <laughs> I think it would be is great. It's much better yeah. than saying, no, 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 you will do it. You know, It's going to be fraud. Yeah, That's yeah. the unproductive conflict. That's the one we're all afraid of. A Indeed. why question is a great start. I, I don't mm. object to it at all. Mm. I'm just suggesting there are some more things you can do to have an even more productive conversation. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm agreeing, of course. And I think it, it, a lot of it as well comes down to that relationship building aspect of good leadership, doesn't it? And I would hope, unless you're really new in your job, you've got a pretty good relationship with these people already at that stage. And they're going to understand, even if you did throw out a why by mistake, they're going to know that you're genuinely just trying to get to a point of position of understanding. Um, but of course, you're we right. We would hope well. that. I find that people who aren't very new in the job have got to know the other person. They say, well, let me tell you, I know this person now and I know exactly what they're like and they're going to butt heads with me. And so I'm going to get in there all defensive, all ready with my, my fists up. And um, I'm not going to be curious when I ask why it is an attack. Well, why do you need that? Why can't you get it done? Why can't you do more for us? Why don't you care? And that uh, is, is very unproductive. I know that's not what you were asking, but um, sure. so often that's where people start because they've had a long-term conflict. A lot of what I do is um, sort of, um, not quite hostage negotiation, but you know, uh, getting, getting people to the table willing to consider the other person might have a point of view that's valid. Yes, yes. And I, I, again, I think that we'll talk about it a bit later, I'm sure, but it speaks very much to my approach to leadership, actually, and mm -hmm. exactly trying to avoid those kind of situations and, and coming from a position of curiosity and putting the people first and all of those nice things. But yes, at Indeed. the same time, of course, again, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it's, uh, particularly if you've got to that position as well, where you're almost like in these silos within your organization and it's all getting a bit territorial and tech and sales aren't getting on. And then it's just conflict is just created in the negative way without even thinking about it, isn't it? And it, it can be all too easy. Sadly. And there are techniques for building trust, some of which are particularly Indeed. effective with engineers, which we can get into if you want to. But when you're in that situation, that's where to start, not with um, asking why, not with um, kind of continuing the conflict that's not productive, but understanding the other person's story first. 
Indeed, indeed. Also very useful for leadership, of course. So. Exactly. And we, we're kind of dancing around this subject already, but my next question for you is, why is it that tech teams can be so hard to manage? Well, so one thing that's it, it, very helpful as a model, and, and I have no uh, psychological backing for this, I haven't done uh, double blind studies or anything, but uh, I firmly believe having worked with thousands and thousands of technologists, that in order to be an effective um, uh, programmer of a computer, you have to be on the autism spectrum somewhere because computers are the most autistic things in the world. They are absolutely black and white. They make no compromises. They um, uh, uh, operate in a completely different neurological framework from actual humans, from normal neuro neurotypical humans. And so people who are somewhere on that spectrum effectively work with computers. Now, I, again, I have no scientific basis for this, but the um, thing that that then helps you with is understanding why are these tech team people so intransigent? Because you'll find that, you know, you try and go have some kind of reasonable negotiation with a technology person and they just say, uh, well, that's impossible. Uh, there's no way that could ever happen. Uh, here are seven reasons why that will uh, be um, a complete disruption to everything that we're doing. And uh, please leave us alone. And that's because that's the answer your computer gives you all the time, right? You get on your phone and you you try to get it to do something. And, it, uh, 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 you know, my, I watch my poor mother-in-law trying to look at pictures. She's just not computer literate. And so she taps on things and nothing happens. And it's not like it says like a human being would do. I see you're trying to tap here. I see you're trying to do something. Let me try to help you. There's a reason that, you know, those pictures were erased. Let's see if we can find them. It doesn't do anything like that. It just says no. No. Can't do it. Um, and uh, the problem is that us engineers, we have to think that way. <laughs> That's our problem. But there's a great saving grace from that. There's something that actually helps us with conversations. And that's what I teach technology folks to do and also non-tech people when they're dealing with tech folks. And that is I help them to uh, uh, use this kind of rigid process-oriented thinking to make a conversation better. So I, I mentioned uh, trust building mechanisms. There's a, a standard thing which you can go look up. It's in, uh, say, um, the fifth discipline uh, by um, uh, Senge, for example, um, called the ladder of inference. And it's a way of building up somebody else's story, understanding how they're thinking that allows you to carefully um, build trust within the person. Uh, but I translated that into something called test-driven development for people. And that's because there's an engineering practice called test-driven development. Not everyone believes in it, but everyone knows what it is. And uh, the, that process is a slow and careful process of getting a computer to do what you want by asking it lots of questions as you go and saying, well, if I do this, will you do that? Will you do this? Will you do that? Oh, you won't do that. Oh, you say, no. oh, well, let me go back then and do something else. You're doing tests at every stage. Well, that's precisely what happens in uh, using the ladder of inference. You say, what data are we looking at? What uh, data, what, out of that data, what um, do you select as being most important? What does that mean for you? What assumptions do you make as a result of that? And on and on up to um, beliefs and actions, which are the things you can actually, the actions are the things you can actually see. But uh, everything else before that is invisible to you. And the ladder of inference helps you discover those things. Well, if you describe this to a salesperson, when I describe this to salespeople or, or customer service or something, I have to talk about it very differently. With engineers, I can say, this is like running a series of tests. Do this test first, do that test second, do this test third. And they go off and they do it and they say, wow, this person really trusts me now. I really have a better way of talking to them. I understand their language. And I say, great, you applied the algorithm and you got the result. And that's how engineers have to think if they're going to be effective at working with computers or with other engineers. And that's why, in my opinion, tech teams have so much trouble, have so much conflict, uh, often very unproductive, because they don't have these skills. The, the core of it for me, I think, is in either direction, really, is it's about understanding the other person and where they're coming from. And yeah, it, it's a sweeping generalization, isn't it? But I think I, I probably agree with you, at least as far as it's quite rare to find the technical skill set and the people skill set in the same individuals. I don't know about the autism. But thing. they can learn. The good news is that yes. it's something you can learn. Yes. Uh, 
potentially both, you know, whichever one they're missing. But mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. I don't I, know I don't get a lot of salespeople doing. asking me to teach them uh, Python programming. Um, the, so that that's there's for some reason there's not that quite that much demand, but there's certainly quite a lot of demand for technologists who mm-hmm. themselves or who other people uh, would like to to have gain this skill of better conversations, productive conflict. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think there's a a fair right, certainly in the industries that I've worked in and with, there's been a a rising number, I think, of sort of the more technical sales approach where the salespeople are also technologists, but not mm. to the same level as the people who are building the thing, but enough that they can talk about it and operate it in front of the customer and that sort of thing. So yep. it doesn't surprise and, me. And you're right. That's a, that's, <laughs> that's a rare and expensive skill. <laughs> well, mate, don't tell them it's expensive. No, we don't want to give them that idea. <laughs> Very intriguing subject to me i think because there's mm-hmm. that whole there's a whole set of problems isn't there that we've already really talked about that could be solved so easily with just better leadership but i think we're oversimplifying if we just say that that's like saying um you know we could solve poverty if we just gave everybody tons of money and well that that's true exactly. but we'd also yeah. create an awful lot of inflation right there's there's um there's a re- there's a real resource problem that causes us to have poor people and we should do something about that um, similarly, there's a real skills lack in huge swathes of uh, the uh, executive population. As I encounter company founders, board members, um, investors um, who just have no clue how to, say, avoid uh, years of wasted investment in technology. And I come along and say, where was your governance? You know, why did nobody ask why or how or um, where did this come from? And uh, nobody did. That's because they they didn't have the skill, and and so yes, lots of things would be fixed if we had better leadership. The problem is how the heck do we get better leadership? That's a very hard hard problem, and and one that you and I are are working with every day. I know. It, yeah, I, I think a big part of better leadership. When I say it is, again, I was being slightly flippant, of course, but mm-hmm. a big part of of better leadership to me is exactly what you've just said. It's it's identifying those skill gaps and then acting to do something about them. Mm-hmm. And, and whether that is in the technical sphere and recognizing what's going to work, what's not, and how and when to make that decision, all of those really crucial things for a business, or whether it's in who's lacking in the people skills and how is that damaging what we're trying to achieve. Or even the self-reflective piece about, are my leadership skills not quite up to it? Should I do something about that? If so, what? Almost <laughs> always that one has a yes. Uh, yes. Although... Quite rare, I found people actually ask themselves that question. Exactly, <laughs> and so I find myself coaching someone within an organization, and then I always set this up with the person who's brought me in, also coaching that person in how to work better with them and with others, and uh, that has a much uh, broader effect, and um, usually is is even more useful to the organization, even more profitable than coaching the person that ostensibly lacked the skills. They did that someone who was working with them also did. One thing I found, I think, with leadership skills in particular is it is that self-awareness problem. And and I hit it quite a lot. Is And it's a big challenge, actually, is trying to get over that hump of helping them to realize that there is that skills gap without just outright telling them because they won't believe you if you do. Mm. Do you see the same thing from the tech side with some of the technology skills? Or is that... Because in my head, it feels like that that's a bit a bit more objective, and it's a bit easier to look at it without the emotions wrapped up in it than leadership. But tell me if that's wrong. Uh, I don't know. Te- technologists are just as human as the rest of us, so the, absolutely, there's that problem. And you have that. You mentioned technology skills. You're right. There is some objective measurement of um, you know, is this person a good coder? Is this uh, per- has this person built a good architecture, and so on. Th- those things are measurable to some extent. But remarkably, the most important bits are less measurable than you think. So um, there, there's the, I have a lot of empathy for folks um, who, who aren't self-aware in these areas because um, there's often very little in the environment that tells them, and there's not a lot of objective measurement that's just not available. Uh, people try to measure engineering productivity in various kinds of goofy ways, like uh, how many lines of code did you write? I think most people know that's not a very effective skill because a lot of times the best thing to do is write no code at all. But um, even better uh, or, or worse, 
um, uh, people try to measure things like story points or function points or something else. Don't worry about what these are if you don't know what they are, because don't learn about them. They're not helpful because they're all trying to measure the output of a pro of a development team in a way that's divorced from the money. It's as if we were measuring the sales organization on how many phone calls they made, just the phone calls, not whether anybody answered or bought anything, or, or how many games of golf they played. It may be that golf and phone calls are an important input, just like code and um, building features and so on is an important result or, or activity that engineers can do. But the thing you actually want to know is, what profit did you make from them? What um, uh, results did you get? Uh, for example, what features are in production that caused somebody to buy your software or create increased usage or um, reduce the drop-off rate in your funnel? Those are the sorts of things you need to measure. And the problem is that you can't generally ascribe them to just one engineer. You can't say it was just this one action that led to it. And so that makes it very hard for someone to be self-aware. How am I, am I the one who, who made this uh, effective? Was it my meeting with the customer? Was it um, my clever new idea for tracking you know, how users were behaving? Was it uh, my nifty design that made it most attractive? The answer is we don't know. We aren't doing a double blind study. So you can only really look crudely at the overall results for the organization and the people who contributed over time and form a human judgment about how well they're doing. So I have a lot of empathy for folks who, who aren't sure uh, whether they're doing well. Um, and uh, the good news is that uh, if you build trust with the rest of the organization, if you um, uh, set up things, uh, set up the processes so that you can be accountable for what you're doing and you get that feedback frequently, uh, if you deliver the software often and you see the results in production, well, then you will form a very clear opinion very quickly. And so will your colleagues about how you're doing. I have a lot, a lot of empathy for them as well, I have to say. And in, in, in any job, really, it is very difficult these days. And I think a lot of people either fall in, or into, again, horrible generalization, but one of two camps. Either they, they're going through some form of imposter syndrome and they're undervaluing their contributions, or the opposite, and they have no sense of reality and they're assuming they're the best. And it's so difficult in so, in so many types of job, exactly as you say, we have this illusion, we have this um, uh, mirage in technology that somehow it's objective and mathematical and uh, we're doing um, some, some kind of scientific activity. We're not. We're building extremely complicated systems for humans who are very unclear and unpredictable. And um, uh, so it, very, very rarely can we uh, form some kind of objective opinion. We have this uh, mirage, this notion that somehow we can, which you don't say in, in sales or, or customer service. So um, it, it's, I think, a little extra hard. Yes, you're probably right. And I think the other thing you've hit the nail on the head with is the way that businesses often choose to measure these things. It may sometimes be objective, but as you say, it's not always tied to actually the outcomes they want. So you, you mentioned in the context of sales, measuring how many phone calls a salesperson makes. Well, that doesn't have any impact really necessarily on their actual success as a salesperson. Sure, I, mean, I can make a lot of phone calls, but I'd be yeah. a terrible salesperson, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want to buy, say, roofing services for me when I phoned up and told you about roofs because I know nothing about them, but I could make an awful lot of phone calls for you. Precisely. but And yet, so many businesses are measuring exactly that as one of their sales metrics for performance of their salespeople. Mm -hmm. uh, and you hear stories, don't you, about the big call centers and they're farming it out and they literally just drop calling because they know for every 10 phone calls, they'll get a, I don't know, a, a $10, a £10 bonus or something and it doesn't matter the outcome or anything. And it's yep. it's a very strange way of doing it. answering the phone going, hello, hello, and yeah. no one's there. Nobody's making, making some money out of that. But there, there's an extreme version of that which is starting to happen and, and that is that uh, some folks are outsourcing their own jobs. So uh, someone will uh, figure out, well, hey, um, chat GPT can do 80% of what I do. So um, I'm going to be working at home here and uh, feed most of what I do into uh, a, a large language model. And I'll get some results from that. Or I'll hire someone off Fiverr to do some of what I do. I'm not suggesting this is ethical, um, but it does reflect that the, the metrics must be really screwed up if you can't tell whether it's a human or a computer doing the job. Yeah, there's some great old stories from from the early days of social media, aren't there, about people who just set up an algorithm back before people had heard of algorithms. Mm -hmm. and, and it just did their job for them and they didn't have to go to work. or. Yep. <laughs> and it took a couple of years before the employer realized. And yeah, it's, it's all fun and games. 
<laughs> but but it makes a, a serious point. Uh, listeners might want to ask themselves, uh, how, how much uh, could someone game the system if they wanted to? If the answer is very easily, you got a problem. Not because someone necessarily will do exactly that. But there are a lot of people who are, are um, as you say, making the, the phone calls without making the effort. Yeah, and I think to me, to tie it back to leadership again, um, people who are properly embedded in their organization, who are bought into the goals and the values and the purpose of what, what it's trying to achieve, who are well-led, who are well-supported, who are given that autonomy and empowerment, all that kind of thing in the right ways, probably aren't going to try and game the system. Of course not. But if you had all of those things, you wouldn't need a whole bunch of complicated metrics like how many phone calls did you make and were they 37 seconds or more. You you would need um, uh, metrics like the ones that you should have, the ones I tell my clients to set up. Uh, How much profit did we make from this um, technology investment? What uh, results did we have for customers? How um, are our customers telling us they uh, like interacting with you? Those sorts of things that are uh, non-gameable and require human judgment um, uh, are, are the sorts of things you'd have in place anyway and that you could have in place effectively. Yes, definitely. And I think that's that's what ties the two things together for me. It's, yeah, really like that approach. So you mentioned ChatGPT, which leads me into the question I have to ask anyone as soon as I know they work in technology. What is your take on the future of AI? Should we be worried um, or we, is it storming a teacup? We we definitely don't need to be worried that uh, it will take over the world and and we'll all be slaves uh, making paper clips or something like that, which is some of the the um, scare tactics people are talking about. I think uh, the application to um, uh, bombs and missiles and airplanes and so on is pretty scary, but not my area, so I'm not going to go into that very much. Uh, but what I will say is, um, in the uh, world of business, it's going to have a very different effect, I think, than than it initially looked like. So uh, you know, I was almost joking about people uh, outsourcing their work to chat GPT. There's not going to be a lot of that because although it's um, capable of producing anodyne um, analyses, they're very boring. So uh, it's pretty easy to tell whether someone's doing a good job uh, in any kind of writing. So the, the notion that we're going to somehow uh, have computers do all our writing for us is at least not happening now. That's, that's certainly not what the tools can do. But the thing everybody's missing, it, well, two things that everyone's missing are um, these tools are fantastic research assistants. So if you wanted to go through uh, a shelf full of documents, you know, my brother managed documents for, for Shell Oil for many years, uh, you know, detailed technical specifications for oil rigs. You really want to know when there's a fire, which bit to look at first and, and where to go. And uh, it, a computer now, these language models, can go through and find that kind of information for you much, much quicker, even than a, a Google Google search or something like that. It, it has a greater understanding. But you wouldn't want to take the output and actually use it for anything. You look at it just like if you had a, a, a bright young uh, person who comes along to be your research assistant and you give them a file drawer with lots of, of data, they'd be um, uh, able to summarize that for you, but then you're going to do the writing. You're going to do the analysis. They've done the research, and that's how people should be thinking about these tools. The other thing that everyone misses is in the title. It's called Chat GPT, and we've just been talking at the beginning about how difficult people find um, productive conversations, productive conflict, having uh, building trust, and so on. There's a wonderful actor inside your computer, actually a troop of actors, uh, who can be anybody you want. Uh, so uh, if you do it um, uh, with a modicum of skill, you can get the machine to pretend to be your angry, cigar-chewing, phone-talking boss who's um, you know always yelling at you and, and a caricature of the actual situation you might be afraid of, and then work out and practice how to have a better conversation with that person. I think there's huge opportunity there, and there's not enough people uh, looking into that and providing tools for it, but I predict there will be uh, soon. It reminds me of one of the mo- more interesting articles I've read about ChatGPT, which was a, a completely left field idea, but it was basically use ChatGPT instead of your friendship group to help mm. you through a breakup. <laughs> so all of that like toxic moaning, complaining, it's, you know, the kind of really depressed stuff that a lot of us go through in those situations. Just vent to, G- to ChatGPT and don't inflict it on your friends. That was the thrust of the article anyway. I'm not sure it was very fair to the human condition or people who might have some genuine mental struggles. And, but. and I don't know that you'd get 
really psychologically valuable help in the way you would from a human being because the machine won't understand it. It will give you these like boring, quite standard, self helpy kind of responses. Oh, yes, soldier through, you know, uh, 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 wake up every morning and say five good things to yourself and so on, which your friends are less likely to do. But practicing how to bring things up to your friends might be really helpful because yeah. you're not so interested in the details of the responses, but you're interested in how you respond and uh, how you might uh, react. So uh, that that's where I think that might be useful. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a good idea. And as you say, the clue is in the name, isn't it? I think everyone's been looking for ways to leverage it for business when that's not necessarily what it's there for. I mean, and we talked, you know, the whole first section of this podcast was all about how do we handle um difficult conversations uh pr- have productive conflicts that's a business application what mm-hmm. people are trying to do is say uh you know how can i have it write all my customer service emails for me yeah. and and that's not the best use of it i'll tell you one place that uh, i've really been impressed is where people use a hybrid so um the term from chess actually is a centaur a human plus a computer and um uh, one example of that is um uh, an architectural firm uh, a company providing services to people building huge skyscrapers. And um, they had a group of human architects uh, who were ready and waiting to hear about what um, needed fixing in the building. Um, but in, instead of just sending directly information about the building to those architects, they would send someone in who had no particular skills other than the ability to point a camera. They take a picture of pretty much everything on floor 35 send it to a computer, which would then do the analysis and find the anomalies. And that's where these language models and these tools um, that uh, can, can uh, um, use machine learning really shine is in looking at a huge volume of information and saying, well, this is the bit that's interesting. And in several places, of course, the architects would say, this is just fine. It looks a little funny, but there was a, a shaft of light in the wrong direction or a reflection or something, and it mixed up the computer, but this one's fine. But this one, shows where they've installed a sprinkler and then they put the drywall over the sprinkler. Well, that's not going to work very well when the sprinkler turns on and nothing comes out. So you need to go back to floor 35, room 3504 and and fix that. So the architect uh, remotely, without having to go on site, can detect problems which have been sorted through first by the computer. And, And that's the sort of usage that you can get that's really valuable for business without trying to have the computer summarize or write it or uh, send any emails to the people on site. That's what the architect does. That's the value of the human half of the centaur. The computer half of the centaur is doing the rote work um, and the sorts of things we haven't been able to have computers do before, looking at huge volumes of data and finding meaningful anomalies. Yes, I I agree again. I'm agreeing with you a lot. That's good. I was going to say, we did talk about conflict at the beginning. Um, I, I, yeah, I think my gut feeling with with all of these AI tools, uh, the more they've developed, it's the more you can use it to replace that, the monotonous, the mundane, the stuff where creativity perhaps is less important, that's where you're going to get really the most power, the most leverage from using it. And as for all the people who are using it to write their marketing on LinkedIn or whatever, I mean, I've tried that myself a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And the, the outputs you get, I mean, they're okay. As you say, they can be a bit boring. They throw emojis in weird places. and But for me, I think the, the bit about it is it just doesn't sound like me. And people mm-hmm. will notice that immediately. So I, I don't really do it. Um, but it, it is an interesting an interesting tool. I guess it's like any database, isn't it? You know, what you get out is only going to be as good as the data you've put in. And and that for me with ChatGPT, because I don't understand enough about what they've trained it on, that's where my trust issue with it is. And I think the other element to it is it's not necessarily giving you factual information. It's just giving mm-hmm. you a distillation of all of its training information. Exactly. Just like that research assistant who might, without really understanding the source material, tell you things that aren't helpful. You just throw those away. If you think of it as a research assistant, if you think of it as your frontline customer service staff, you're in a world of trouble. Absolutely. Yes. And and I guess in a way, it's no different to any other piece of technology is that you just got to really understand how it works and where its value is before you try and apply it to every Uh, single aspect of your company. (laughs) It's different in the the level of its rapid applicability. I think even the open AI people were surprised by how quickly chat GPT took off and became meaningful because it has such a, a, a an interface that's easy to use. It's, a, it's almost like a, if you use Siri or the Echo or um, one of those tools that does uh, recognizes your voice, 
the, the problem with those is, of course, they don't understand what you mean. So if they mishear you, they go do exactly the wrong thing, order the wrong product or whatever. ChatGPT is much better at that. And, and that's a huge advance. And that really changes how people interact with computers, which is a very, very good thing. The problem is people just misapplied it and used it for things it shouldn't be. Yes. Yeah, fair enough. And one other really interesting thing I've heard about it lately, I have some in conversation with someone just the other week, actually. And it was, they basically posed it as a question. So if if it's using, say, the internet and all of that available information and as its training data, at a certain point, it's going to start getting less good because how much of the internet now is chat GPT produced content? Yes, yeah, so it's going to start feeding on itself. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. Uh, I, I think the people who are working with it are clever enough, um, at least the ones I've uh, inter interacted with, the people who set up that architect um, mm -hmm. skyscraper evaluation service, for example, they're usually pretty good at filtering. And so what you find is that the source material just has to be uh, high enough volume and decent quality, and uh, you, you get reasonable results. Much, much more of a problem uh, in, in actually interpreting the results, using them, uh, making them valuable for, for people. Yeah, it was. I asked that question slightly just because I found it funny. But. Oh, I agree. <laughs> I'm enjoying the, the the questions. Keep them coming. Yeah. Okay. So, um, last question, I guess, in this section of our discussion, a bit more about you and about your career. So, if you had to pick hmm. out one achievement from your career up to now that you're most proud of, what would that be? Oh, now that's a really tough one. Most proud of. Um, and I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit, uh, producing intellectual property that really makes a difference in um, creating productive conflict and, and making profit from technology. There's some material like the test-driven development for people that really has a life of its own. And, and I'm pretty excited about that, that people are quoting me and using the ideas and reading my book and so on. The fact that it has some life beyond me is... Um, uh, really fulfilling. That's what I want to do because I, I just see the world filled with unproductive conflict, with technology being misused, with um, uh, people making investments in software that have no even potential payoff for them. And if I can make a small dent in that, uh, I'm, I'm pleased about it. That's quite a good answer, though, a difficult question. So, Thank you. Well, I enjoyed well the question. <laughs> Now let's talk a bit more specifically about leadership because I know we've been hinting at it already, but mm -hmm. what are the biggest leadership lessons that you've learned in your career so far? Well, work yourself out of a job sure comes to mind quickly. Um, yeah. uh, um, I think you have to combine humility with an ability to boast, which is not something that <laughs> many people have. Um, in other words, you have to be willing to learn that things you think don't work and are, are incorrect and, and that there are better ways. And that um, at the same time, you have to be able to be a very strong advocate and a very passionate and articulate advocate for the culture and approaches and the opinions that you have. You know, one of the biggest problems I see over and over again is uh, people build software that isn't opinionated enough. In other words, the, the product you put in front of people tries to be all things to everyone and, and fails. Whereas the most effective software or really any product is one that has a strong opinion about the world that comes through from the people who are building it, which ultimately comes from their leaders. We believe, you know, Apple, for example, believes software is going to be better if it's linked to the hardware. We're going to build everything that goes into your hands and we're going to make that a fantastic customer experience for you. If you show up at Apple and think, I want to be interoperable and I want lots of pieces that can fit into lots of other pieces like a Lego, they, the, the, the people at Apple are going to reject you, you know, like a, a transplant that doesn't work. That's the wrong blood type. It's just not going to work at Apple because even though their leader is no longer with us, that leader and his successors have pounded home this cultural point of view that you need a unified experience for the customer. And uh, leaders who don't do that wind up with boring companies that try to be everything to everyone leaders who uh, can pound home a cultural message while being willing to learn about how to improve it do really well. But that's a hard combination. Yeah, the, the opposites of humility and I, I would call it self-promotion, I guess, rather than boasting. 
humility, I think, is really important for, for good leadership because I think there's the, particularly when you're already in a, let's call it a position of authority, there is that immediate risk, isn't there, that people will perceive you're just giving into your ego and making it all about yourself. So having having that humility is really important. But then I do agree with you. It's also quite important to to know your value and be able to talk about that. And I think the difference between those is timing and getting that timing right. And that is something that I've always struggled with. I know a lot of people have struggled with and probably always will. The trick is to do both at the same time. Oof. So, that, and, and that sounds something like this. Here's how I view the situation. You're being transparent. Uh, I, I'm working toward this. I'm looking to build this type of software, with this type of team that serves this type of customer. And I'm also willing to learn that I'm wrong. I'm willing to learn something that might be different. That's being curious. So this combination of transparency and curiosity is really tough to pull off. You're exactly right. But um, uh, where you can do it effectively, you uh, learn a lot while still reinforcing a point of view and in um, a, a leadership approach. What has been your own best experience of being led? Oh, good question. I certainly have a good answer for you. One thing I should note, by the way, is I'm running out of battery here in my car. So we, uh, we may, <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm enjoying talking to you, but we may we may uh, run out here at some point. But, um, uh, well, speaking of batteries, uh, a really effective leader um, juices up the battery, really energizes the people beneath him or her, gets them excited about the, um, the mission or the direction so that they're um, thinking all the time about how to improve rather than just um, turning the crank that's put in front of them. The trick is really to um, uh, be willing to hear what um, people in your organization are feeling about uh, what you're building, what you're doing, what you're asking them to do, and incorporate that into uh, your point of view. Um, so that, that particular individual did that the best that I know of is the very first CEO I ever worked for. And he had been a McKinsey consultant for 20 years, and somehow he'd survived that experience, which was uh, did not teach him great leadership, I think. It told him, told him, taught him everything not to do. And um, he managed to combine the uh, humility and, um, uh, and advocacy uh, uh, better than anyone I've really seen because uh, he had to lead us through um, uh, acquisition, through... Uh, challenges in uh, market through um, uh, difficulties in our product. Uh, he had uh, all kinds of things to overcome, but he was always willing to listen to those of us who knew more about it. He was not a technologist um, and uh, certainly understands technology very well, but isn't someone who writes code or builds new software or, or uh, uses chat GPT in some clever way. Uh, he's uh, um, and, and he was able to listen to us, even when he really didn't want to, and uh, incorporate things we brought to him, like um, uh, working much more closely with customers and delivering very frequently to them. And when we were able to do that, he saw the results. He said, wow, we're able to go back to the client every week and build something new for them and get their feedback. This is really valuable. We should do more of that, even though I don't understand how Squirrel is doing it. Um, so he's a really good, fantastic example. Yeah, or listening when you don't want to. That That is such a skill, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I remember once he said, why couldn't we just send the engineers for typing lessons so that they could um, type faster and get more code done? And it took a long time of um, uh, trust for him to see that that wasn't effective. But from his point of view, to start with, it seemed like produce more code, we'll get more results. It wasn't wrong. Uh, he, he just needed to listen to us a bit more. And much more importantly, we needed to listen to him to understand where the company was going. Bittersweet or a double-edged sword, isn't it, in a way that your most positive leader memory is early in your career? Because it's the same mm. for me. Like The first leader I ever worked for was probably the best one I ever have. And then everyone since then has just sort of failed to stack up in my mind. <laughs> Or you could say positively, you had a good, you had a good role model and you'd have, um, you can see more clearly how the others can improve. True. Very much like like the leader you just told us about, you know, he's, he's had that bad experience and learned what not to do. So there you go. It, it helps in both Indeed. ways, I guess. Um, so conscious of time and your battery. Um, I'll yes. do two more questions. The first one, if you could go back to back in time to the start of your career, is there anything you would do differently? 
oh, I would study conversations and uh, improve my skills in building trust much earlier because I remember um, doing things I just uh, cower from in, in, in horror, uh, like um, telling my engineers, oh, don't worry about the suits. I'll go take care of them. And, uh, you know, I'll tell them why they're all wrong. And, uh, you know, I built a lot of camaraderie among the engineers, but it was against the rest of the organization. What a stupid idea. So I'd uh, uh, discover the things I discovered later much sooner and go and study them and, and improve my conversational skill and conflict, uh, pr- my ability to create productive conflict. I think that's, that, I like that answer because it's honest. You know, most mm. people, when they're asked that question, the default response is, I, would, I wouldn't change anything because it's got mm. me where I am today. I, I don't agree with that at all. I know, I know, and it is a, it's a bit of a dilemma though, because on the one hand, yeah, it's true. I can buy into that. But at the same time, who honestly looks at their past life and thinks, I wouldn't do any of those moments differently. <laughs> I, would, I would love to change them. Tell You tell me when you have that time machine. Yeah. Um, it's going to arrive now. Excellent. Oh, it's worth a try. <laughs> it was. Good thought. Leadership Heroes. If you had to pick one person who could be alive or dead, past, present, real or fictitious, if you like, who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership, who would that person be and why? Interesting. So uh, perfectly, I don't think I'm going to manage, but I will uh, wear my you know, my nerdhood um, proudly and uh, say Jean-Luc Picard from the uh, um, uh, Star Trek um, for Next Generation uh, series of teleprograms. Uh, and the reason is that um, the, the, it's the only place on any kind of dramatic program, whether it's a, a teleprogram or a movie or a play or anything else, it's the only place where I've seen a leader depicted whose first reaction to some crisis, some event, you know, the Klingons show up and they're going to shoot at the, at the, the spaceship. Uh, his first reaction is not to act. His first reaction is to call together people who know about it and they meet. So he calls a meeting and this is dramatically interesting. It's just astonishing that, you know, someone can make a very popular television program out of somebody whose main uh, activity, main reaction is, is to get into the, the room and discuss with the relevant people. But that's what you should be doing. You know, it's doing that curiosity that we've been talking about all the way through. It's, it's um, displaying it for us. The problem and the thing that I think the writers of Star Trek did very well is to, to make that dramatic and interesting and, and thrilling. Uh, and it's rarely pulled off. The, the recent movie Oppenheimer has a little bit of that. Uh, that you know, it's mostly you know, there's a lot of explosions of nuclear bombs and things, but the the, uh, the main activity is a bunch of people thinking and writing on chalkboards and and coming up with plans and and, and uh, uh, designing stuff. And um, that's not as dramatic, but boy, is it valuable. Yes, and more real, I think. Um, yeah. It's- it's interesting. So we've had we have had Picard picked before. Oh, okay. Um, but for different reasons, and and I I do find your reason a very interesting one. If not least because a lot of the reviews and critics were slamming the series for exactly that reason of we're under not attack. Enough, let's have a meeting. Not enough people <laughs> shooting at things. Yeah. Why don't we just shoot the Klingons? Well, maybe the Klingons have a point. Maybe they're here for a good reason. We could find out. We could learn something we didn't know. Yes, true. Although I have to say. For anyone who's familiar with Klingons, they don't tend to give you time to have a meeting. They just start shooting. Yeah. <laughs> but that was part of the point. Man, I could go with Star Trek geekdom forever, and I really will yeah. run out of battery. But the, yeah. the point is that um, uh, the Klingons got more of an upgrade later mm-hmm. in the series, and exactly True. in the next generation. So um, you found out that the enemies who were just the faceless, um, uh, non-negotiable, uh, implacable foes turned into folks who had by families and lives and um, behaviors and things that actually made some sense. You might not agree with them, and you might still be in danger from them, but boy, it sure helped to be curious about them. Yes, absolutely, and it's a very powerful lesson for leadership, isn't it? it it's listen, it's have that conversation, it's get alternative points of view, You know, consider the options. And as much as, particularly in things like TV and film, where leaders are usually depicted as the rapid thinkers, the decisive actors, the people who know what's right and they do it and it doesn't matter what anyone else says. Actually, in, in real life, those kind of leaders are usually pretty dysfunctional. So Exactly. They're very uh, yeah. dramatic. It's very exciting. You, you stick around through the commercial break, but, boy, you wouldn't want to work there. Yeah. 
indeed indeed dysfunctional and even if they're right which i you know it's it's pretty rare in this day and age isn't it that someone is going to have that good a grasp of everything in the organization that they're going to get that decision right every time Especially if they make it alone which is so distributed and where the skills are so widely varied absolutely yeah so there we go be more picard that's, that's yep. a good conclusion. Awesome. Well, Douglas, thank you so much for your time. Uh, last thing I'll ask is, if any of the listeners want to learn more about you or what you what you do, could you point them towards a website, a book, a podcast, all of the above? I can. I can, I can point them to two things. And yes, all of the above are, are at one of these two. So one is DouglasSquirrel.com. So that's all about me and what I do. And so you just have to remember my name and then you can find me. And there you can find my podcast and my writings and all kinds of things that I do and consulting and other stuff like that. And I also run a community, totally free. It's my way of giving back. A community of tech and non-tech people working together. It's the only community like that I, I have ever seen. And uh, um, what we do is we discuss um, on a forum uh, all kinds of questions like the ones we've been talking about here today, questions about new technologies, ideas for uh, building software better. Um, we have weekly events, which are also free on um, uh, keeping your work visible and making sure you know what your engineers are doing. Uh, so that's squirrelsquadron.com. So the two places to go are douglassquirrel.com and squirrelsquadron.com. I love that website. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Well, that's that's it from, from me then. And um, thank you again so much for your time today. It's been great talking to you. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry to make extra editing trouble for you with uh, oh, no some worries. challenges no worries. here in the car. Now I have to go figure out how to do the rest of my calls today. But um, uh, at least I managed to get on with you. I appreciate it. No and worries. Really good questions. Really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, me too. Appreciate that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, sir. Have a wonderful day. And if you would like to learn more about leading with integrity, about my leadership, mentoring and training programs, or just get in touch with me and have a chat about leadership, then please do visit www.leadernotaboss.com. It's a new website, recently refurbished. On there, you'll find links to all sorts of things, including my brand new leadership challenges quiz. So figure out what it is that's stopping your leadership from achieving its full potential through a, a very cool quiz. And I hope you'll enjoy that. As I say, that's quite new, so feedback is most appreciated. You will also find links to join the Integrity Leaders community, find other episodes of the podcast, if this is the first you're listening to, and there's even a link there to book a meeting with me if you would like to have a conversation about leadership. So all of that and more on that website. Pay a visit today, get in touch, I'd love to hear from you. And that's all I've got time for today. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you and your time, all of you listeners. And I will see you next week. Well, I won't see you, probably. You'll see me, maybe, and you'll hear me. But yeah, I will be here next week. In the meantime, remember, be a leader, not a boss. <laughs> <laughs>